Section three of the Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly. Chapter three Samhain. On November first was Samhain, summer's end. Take my tidings, stags contend, snows descend, summer's end. A chill wind raging, the low sun keeping, swift to set, o'er seas high sweeping, dull red the fern, shapes are shadows, wild geese mourn o'er misty meadows, keen cold limes each weaker wing, icy times, such I sing, take my tidings. Graves, first winter song. Then the flocks were driven in, and men first had leisure after harvest toil. Fires were built as thanksgiving to Baal for harvest. The old fire on the altar was quenched before the night of October 31st, and the new one made, as were all sacred fires, by friction. It was called forced fire. A wheel and a spindle were used. The wheel, the sun symbol, was turned from east to west, sunwise. The sparks were caught in tow, blazed upon the altar, and were passed on to light the hilltop fires. The new fire was given next morning, New Year's Day, by the priest to the people to light their hearths, where all fires had been extinguished. The blessed fire was thought to protect the year through the home it warmed. In Ireland the altar was Tlachtga, on the hill of Ward in Meath where sacrifices, especially black sheep, were burnt in the new fire. From the death struggles and look of the creatures, omens for the future year were taken. The year was over, and the sun's life of a year was done. The Celts thought that at this time the sun fell a victim for six months to the powers of winter darkness. In Egyptian mythology, one of the sun gods, Osiris, was slain at a banquet by his brother Situ, the god of darkness. On the anniversary of the murder, the first day of winter, no Egyptian would begin any new business for fear of bad luck, since the spirit of evil was then in power. From the idea that the sun suffered from his enemies on this day grew the association of Samhain with death. The melancholy days are come, the saddest of the year, of wailing winds and naked woods and meadows brown and sere. Heaped in the hollows of the grove, the withered leaves lie dead. They rustle to the eddying gust and to the rabbit's tread. The robin and the wren are flown, and from the shrub the jay, and from the wood-top calls the crow through all the gloomy day. The wind-flower and the violet, they perished long ago, and the wild rose and the orchids died among the summer glow. But on the hill the goldenrod and the aster in the wood, and the yellow sunflower by the brook in autumn beauty stood till fell the frost from a cold, clear heaven, as falls the plague on men, and the brightness of their smile was gone from upland, glade, and glen. Bryant, Death of the Flowers In the same state as those who are dead are those who have never lived, dwelling right in the world, but invisible to most mortals at most times. Seers could see them at any time, and if very many were abroad at once, others might get a chance to watch them too. There is a world in which we dwell, and yet a world invisible, and do not think that naught can be, save only what with eyes ye see. I tell ye that, this very hour, had but your sight a spirit's power, ye would be looking eye to eye at a terrific company. Cox, Halloween These supernatural spirits ruled the dead. There were two classes, Tuatha de Danon, the people of the goddess Danu, gods of light and life, and spirits of darkness and evil. The Tuatha had their chief seat on the Isle of Man, in the middle of the Irish Sea, and brought under their power the islands about them. On a midsummer day they vanquished the fir bogs and gained most of Ireland by the Battle of Moitura. A long time afterwards, perhaps 1000 BC, the Fomer, sea demons, after destroying nearly all their enemies by plagues, exacted from those remaining as tribute a third part of their corn, a third part of their milk, and a third part of their children. This tax was paid on Samhain. It was the week before Samhain that the Fomor landed upon Ireland. On the eve of Samhain the gods met them in the second battle of Moitura, and they were driven back into the ocean. As Tigernmas, a mythical king of Ireland, was sacrificing the firstlings of every issue, and the scions of every clan, to Crom Croic, the king idol, and lay prostrate before the image, he and three-fourths of his men mysteriously disappeared. Then came Tigernmas, the prince of Terra yonder, on Halloween with many hosts, a cause of grief to them was the deed. Dead were the men of Bamba's host, 
without happy strength, around Tigernmas, the destructive man of the north, from the worship of Kramkuak. T'was no luck for them, for I have learned, except one-fourth of the keen gales, not a man alive lasting the snare, escaped without death in his mouth. Desencus of Maxleg, Meyer Translation This was direct invocation, but the fire rites which were continued so long afterwards were really only worshipping the sun by proxy, in his nearest likeness, fire. Samhain was then a day sacred to the death of the sun, on which had been paid a sacrifice of death to evil powers. Though overcome at Moitura, evil was ascendant at Samhain. Methods of finding out the will of spirits and the future naturally worked better then. Charms and invocations had more power, for the spirits were near to help, if care was not taken to anger them, and due honors paid. End of section 3. Read by Professor Heather Mbai. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.